So, what is Linux exactly? Linux is a competing operating system to like Microsoft Windows. It will run on a desktop computer. It will run on servers. In fact, in fact uh, the Linux has really taken over the server world. Uh, almost anything that you use on the internet, any website that you go to, the back end is Linux. It's not Windows, it's Linux. Um, most of the time, that's what it is. It really, really took over the server world as an operating system. It's where I spent the vast majority of my uh, professional career was working with Linux and firewalls and switches and stuff like that when I got into the IC security side of things. But really a huge percentage of my time was involved with Linux. Uh, Drop 2 says the Australian and UK governments admitted that uh, the uh, rhymes with Maxine will not immunize anyone from the special flu. Why bother then? Um, well, it's the stats are showing that it's having no effect whatsoever in my city. The stats are exactly the same now, really, in terms of the increases and stuff that we saw before all of those people were vaccinated. I don't think it's having the slightest impact. Anyway, Linux. Um, it has taken the server world. It, it, it took over the server world from Microsoft long ago, probably 20 years ago, at least. Um, it is the back end for everything that you use on the internet. You don't know it because you don't see it. But people like me who used to build stuff like this, uh, we saw it constantly. It was really my job for the vast majority of my IT career. I was a very early adopter of it for a specific uh, set of circumstances that uh, I don't need to go into. It's too technically complex. Um, but it is a competitive operating system. It is the server world's operating system, no question about that. It is also, uh, it can run on the desktop, although I would have to say that you would need to have a specific use case for it. If you're a gamer, you do not want Linux. Just forget it because Microsoft Windows-based games, you can kind of sometimes get them to run on Linux, but there tend to be issues, and it involves a bunch of stuff that if you're really not a geek, um, you don't even want to try. Um, I suggest not bothering. If you're a gamer, just you know, keep Windows. It's just a problem. No problem. Drop Drew says, is it true um, or, or mere conjecture that the next brew of Windows will have a Unix uh, Linux kernel? No, not really. Uh, for several years now, a couple of releases of uh, Windows on the desktop, they've had a uh, Linux uh, um, runtime, which means that you can run Linux programs underneath uh, sort of under the hood and get them to run on Windows. I have never used this. Um, my general feeling is if you're, you know, in, in, in my part of the world, if you're going to be running, uh, if you're going to be running Linux programs, just run on a Linux computer. Uh, why kill yourself trying to make it on Windows? That's kind of silly. Um, I think down the road a piece, maybe we will see where Microsoft has, because they get closer and closer to it all the time. We may see where Microsoft decides that, yes, um, essentially layering their own Windows interface on top of Linux uh, will make more financial sense for them. I don't know that that'll happen because that would be a massive transition for all of the products they have. But, you know, maybe. Marshall, hey, nice to see you here, Marshall. You'll be a guest later on. Is saying Linux was subsystem for Windows. LSW is now a standard feature of Windows, but the kernel is still a Windows kernel. Yes, uh, that's 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 what I was saying. You can kind of run Windows programs under it. Um, it goes through a layer to let you do it, uh, but you know it's 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 still Windows under the hood. All of us who have been using uh, Linux for decades now, we're just waiting with bated breath until Microsoft finally decides, maybe it'll be 20 years down the road, who knows, uh, that in order to remain competitive, they may just shift over to Linux and put Windows interface on top of it. I don't know that they'll do that. Um, it would be a massive, massive change for them. They would have to redo almost everything uh, that they currently sell. Um, they would have to re-change it completely. And, and it doesn't seem likely to me, particularly on the server side of the world. But in the server side of the world, Linux runs the Internet. Linux is the backbone of the Internet. Almost everything that you use online is probably back-ended by Linux in some way or another. Now, they do operate as well on the desktop, but again, you have to have a kind of a specific use case for it. So, for example, my mother, who's elderly, um, she is running Linux Mint on her desktop, and she's running it because I'm a geek, 
you can, interesting thing about Linux on the desktop is you can trick it out to look like a number of different things. You can trick it out to make it look like an Apple Macintosh or Mac. You can trick it out to look like Windows. You can trick it out to look like really old stuff that nobody but geeks ever see anymore. Um, the desktop itself is very, very highly configurable. In her case, I have it tricked out to look like Windows 95. Um, the, you know, the Windows decorations and where you see the programs and the, you know, the taskbar and all that, it's, it's tricked out to look like that because that's what she's comfortable with. But the reason that she's running it is twofold. First, she only does a limited number of things. She does things like, you know, looking at sites on the Internet. She does things like checking email and things like that. These are all things for which there are very good programs under Linux because the Linux desktop has, you know, it used to be 10, 20 years ago that there weren't very many programs. Now there are a jillion of very good programs that you can run on the desktop that are you know, graphical programs that oftentimes are designed to look exactly the way that they would under Windows and act the same way. The thing about it is, the reason I prefer Linux on hers is because it's much, 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 much more stable. Linux is way more stable than um, off Microsoft Windows. It's just that simple. It's way, way, way more stable. It's part of the reason that it took over the server world because we can have this stuff up for long periods of time and not have to worry about it. Windows is unfortunately notorious for just going to a blue screen of death for no damned good reason. And if you're in the middle of some production thing where you're, you're every minute that, that something is down, and I've had this happen in my, my career, you're losing literally millions of dollars per minute as it's down. You don't want that to happen. <laughs> You want to make sure everything's up. So you build your infrastructure, you build everything around the Linux uh, because it will simply run more stably. Um, Marshall says it might be faster than you think. Oh, really? Okay, you're talking about Microsoft switching. Uh, they'd have to move the Windows API to Linux, which is already done, and provide an execution engine, which they have already have in the Windows kernel. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible. They, they, you know, we just keep waiting. We just keep waiting for Microsoft Linux to start appearing. It would certainly be helpful for them on the server side. If they could do things like, you know, port over Microsoft SQL Server, they would then have a much more stable platform for that to run on. You know, uh, Microsoft Exchange, which is a huge bitch to try to maintain. I've done it. I've taught it. It sucks. It's one of those things that as a system has been administrator side of the world, I, I'm glad I don't ever have to touch again. Uh, but those are all things that would need to be ported. And again, they would run on a more stable platform to start with. Um, so it might be something. Drop Dude is asking, what's my opinion of Ubuntu? Um, let's see. Mar just hack us half a second about that because I'm going to talk about that. That's a desktop uh, version of the operating system. Marsha said, no, it would be a brilliant move in your opinion. They'd open up the operating system in a whole new ecosystem while maintaining the ability to run native Windows applications. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a bad idea. I don't think it's a bad idea. And And... As you say, it may come sooner than we think. I, I just keep waiting for that box that says Microsoft Linux. I probably won't run it, but I, I'm waiting for that box. In terms of desktop operating systems, like you're seeing here, uh, Ubuntu is a, is a version of Linux. And here's the thing about Linux. Linux is what they call free and open source software. That means that the, the software that's underlying the operating system itself and the overwhelming majority of programs that you can run on Linux the source code, that is the things that the, computer, the programmers write so that the program will run, is available for anyone to look at. It's one of the things that makes Linux much more stable because somebody, you know, there are a lot of geeks, a lot of geeks around the world who just like to look at this stuff for fun, you know. They, they look at it to learn things. They look at it for fun. And when you have half a million eyes, which is certainly possible in, in a world this size, half a million eyes, looking at the same code, they can find an error and then submit it to the people who are responsible for maintaining that code. And they go, oh, I'll fix for this. Done. Um, that happens all the time uh, with programs, with the operating system itself. Things that could be fixed that Microsoft would take a long time to roll out can be fixed in very short order because we have many, many different eyes on this. The closed source world, which is what Microsoft operates in, you will never see the source code for Microsoft Exchange. That is something they maintain internally. You will never see it. Almost everything that goes on in the Linux world, someone who's knowledgeable enough can look at it and see how it works. And in fact, this has happened over time. 
If you take a free and open source software that's uh, licensed under a certain license, if you take that and you say, I don't like the way this is working, I'm going to fork it. You take all the code, you move it over here, and suddenly you start working on something that does what you think is working better. Slightly different product, works better, maybe you'll have the users shift from one to the other. You can do that to your heart's content. That's what free and open source software, we call it FOSS, will allow you to do. Take this stuff and do anything that you want with it. On the, the side of Linux itself, because this is all open, there is no one distributor for Linux. There are many distributors for Linux, each of whom have a certain way of doing things that maybe make it more palatable for people who are in a professional, you know, doing something in a data center like this where you need lots of support. There's like Red Hat Linux, which is now owned by IBM or was the last time I checked, it moves around. But Red Hat is really intended for the server world. It has a lot of things going for it that are good for the server world. And because it is a professional one that you pay money for, that means you have support for it. You can call them at any time with your support contract and say, hey, I need help with something. Then there are, and, and we call these various different th ways of putting things together and creating the operating system to look a certain way and behave a certain way. We call these distributions or distros. And many, many different companies have different distros. Red Hat has a distro, Ubuntu has a distro, and then you have other ones that are maybe a little less known, but I think work better than some of the bigger named ones. Um, real quick to check over in my chat because a few of them switched through while we went through. Drop True says, the problem I have with Microsoft utilizing a Windows for Linux form is it may be, uh, they may try to close its open source availability, a bit like Google did with Android, uh, like Neo in the Matrix in terms of looking at code. Yeah. Um, yeah, and Marshall says, look at, work on, compile, fix, learn from. Open source is amazingly good for computer industry, not so good for the bottom line as it removes the proprietary nature. It is certainly possible, and Microsoft Windows is, uh, uh, well, um, Marshall's answering that Android is open source. The drivers are closed. There are things about it that are closed, but the underlying part of the operating system, what we call the kernel, the very deepest, basest core of what makes up the functions of the, of the um, Linux operating system, is open source, and people can do that things with it. Um, would Microsoft try to make some of it uh, closed source? No question in my mind. No question in my mind at all. I don't think they could make the kernel closed source. That would be impossible. And a lot of the tools that come with it would probably not be closed source. But if you went with something like Microsoft Exchange, yeah, they're never going to let you see the code for that. That is an internal thing that they will never, ever put out there for others to see. Marshall says, most reliable distros are Debian and Arch. They own the majority of the internet servers because they're most robust and stable. Yes, that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. Um, those are the most, uh, most reliable ones. And when you get into uh, the one that I prefer on the desktop, uh, Ubuntu is okay. Um, Ubuntu is a good one, but I find its interface clunky and weird. It is hard for the per a person who is used to Windows to deal with the interface on Ubuntu. It's, it's clunky and weird. I don't like it at all. I don't suggest it. it. It can confuse you very easily. What I really do suggest, however, on the desktop, and this is the one my mother's running, is uh, Linux Mint. And this is a Debian, as Microsoft mentions, a Debian-based uh, um, uh, 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 distribution. Um, I've got a link for it. It's, uh, uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, linuxmint.com real easily. Um, and Marshall Singh's great distro for the desktop. Yes, and the cool part about it is, while it comes out of the box, looking very, very similar to the Windows desktop. You can, as I say, if you're geek enough, like I am, you can trick it out to look like anything. And so for my mother to make things easy for her, I have tricked it out to look exactly like Windows. She really sees no difference between what she's dealing with on the desktop and what Windows looks like, well, really Windows 95. Because after that, to me, frankly, the interface got to, got to, got to became more clunkier and easy, harder to deal with. She was used to that. And for her, that is a very good desktop for her to look like. But out of the box, still, it's going to look quite a lot like Windows. You will not be confused by it. Uh, Ubuntu will be kind of confusing. <laughs> 
So I, I recommend it. Um, and as you're saying, drop it to a saw an old Pentium laptop running Linux Mint, and it flew like an i5. That is the other thing about Linux, is it is not sucking up system resources the way that Windows does. Windows has a long history of becoming bloater and bloater and bloater. What happened was you started out with MS-DOS, and MS-DOS was a very limited operating system. Then we got into Windows. Well, for a long time, Windows had to support MS-DOS programs because that was what was out there. So they were essentially layering Windows on and keeping DOS underneath it, which was very clunky. Then they kind of finally started to phase out of that, got into a newer version, but still there were things that they had to keep supporting. And so the operating system just kind of grew and grew and grew and grew. And for the longest time, the versions of Windows would become an upgrade the moment that Intel came out with a newer, faster processor. Because you needed the newer, faster processor to run the new version of Windows. It just got to be clunky. And it still kind of is. Linux, on the other hand, much more streamlined. Even the desktops are much more streamlined. They will run on much older hardware, much, much faster. Stuff that Windows simply will not run on. If you're really interested in taking an older desktop, a desktop computer, and, and getting a modern operating system with modern programs that will run on it pretty well, yeah, a Pandium will run a good version of, of Linux. It, it's just fine. It can do older hardware very, very easily. Um, Drop it to says, do you have an app for making Mint look like Windows 95? My dad would enjoy that. Do I have an app for it? No. It's kind of beyond the scope of a discussion like this. Um, it has themes. The way that Windows used to have themes, it has themes. And you can download from a couple of websites. Maybe I'll do another video that gets into this in more detail, but you can download a theme that looks like Windows 95. And you just install the theme and boom, there it is. It looks like Windows 95. Marshall is saying he runs Mint on my Docker laptop. Uh, Docker is another thing that you can do that's uh, well outside the scope of this discussion. But it's a Ryzen 7, 32 gig RAM, 1.5 terabyte total space. Fast as a bunny, never needs to be re rebooted. Always as snappy as the uh, Rosinante avoiding stealth ships. Hey, cool. Um, yes, and that's another cool thing about Linux. Oh, God. The upgrade process for Windows sucks. I mean, it really just sucks. Um, if you want to upgrade programs, you're downloading programs from some website someplace, and anytime there's an update, you have to download it again and do the update. If the operating system itself wants to update, it's going to do a bunch of stuff under the hood. And these days, it doesn't even give you the option of rebooting. It reboots whether you want it to or not. And sometimes, I've had it happen, oh God, it's miserable when it happens. Sometimes they'll release a new version that has a bug. And all of a sudden, if you're supporting 250 servers in a data center, every single one of them has the damn bug. And you have to roll it back to the previous version of Windows until they fix the bug for the next time around. It's miserable. Linux, on the other hand, very simple. Um, there are background processes that will run to do the upgrades. You very rarely need to actually reboot for the upgrades to take place. And when you do, it's just a shim simple down up, you're done. Um, the applications themselves, <coughs> applications themselves are cataloged and kept in various places in what they call repositories. And these repositories, you can add repositories for various programs if you want. Sometimes, like if you download Brave Browser, which is available for all operating systems, including Android, if you download the Brave Browser, it will automatically set up what its repositories are so that when your computer goes out and you can schedule it to go look or just let its you know, defaults go, when it goes out to find new software, it'll say, oh, I've got a new one out of this, re uh, out of this uh, repository. I'll grab that. Oh, I've got something out of the main repository. I'll grab that. And then it'll pull them down and it'll say, do you want to upgrade this stuff? You let it upgrade and boom, you're done. Nothing else has to happen. You get your software not from specific websites, but from repositories that are configured in most of them by default. The overwhelming majority of them you will never have to touch. The upgrades go slick. I mean really slick. 
Upgrading Linux is so easy. Upgrading programs on Linux is so easy. And one of the coolest parts about it, if you're an end user, you know, if you look at Microsoft, when you look at the start menu, you have four million programs that start to fill up because they just shove the program into the main part of the start menu. Linux automatically catalogs what kind of program it is. So like if it's an office program, and there is a great office program, I'll talk about it in a second. If it is an office program, it will, it will put it in the start menu in a slot for office programs. You don't have this jillions and jillions and jillions of programs. You have this essentially subfolders, excuse me, that are filled with these programs. And it's all done automatically. You don't have to touch it. It does it totally automatically. So if you're an end user, your start menu is really easy to deal with. If it sounds like a gush over this, I do. I used to run this channel um, on a old, very old, um, I don't remember what it was. It was a circa 19, uh, 29, 14 computer. It was when I was only able to do 1080p and 60 frame, 30 frame, 10 frames per second. Sorry, 720p, 10 frames per second. But I was running that off of a Linux computer. I was, you know, really killing it trying to do this stuff. But I was still running it off of that. And again, very, very slick. Everything just updates. You don't have to worry about it. It'll ask you, do you want to update this? Or it'll say, hey, we updated the, you know, the kernel, the really core part of the operating system. Do you want to reboot? It won't tell you. It doesn't require you to. It'll just show a notification and give you the option of when to do it. It is awesome that way and much more stable. Marshall says, uh, yes, da da for Linux is at, apt to get update, apt to get upgrade. Yeah, on the desktop, you don't even see it that way. Um, that's something that we as systems admins will do on a command line or more frequently automate it to do it on a command line, uh, especially if you're running it on many, many servers like I was doing. And I'll show you kind of how that works in a minute. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's really easy. It's really, really easy. You're not going out there and trying to find programs from many different websites. You're just getting them off of repositories that are generally pre-configured. Pre-configured ones will work fine for you. There are many, many, many programs that either look like Windows programs that do the same job or slightly different but still do the same thing that Windows does. The, if you're going to cross over to the Linux world, you will find yourself with programs that you can very easily adjust to. I mean, it's got everything. <clears throat> Excuse me, I tried to, I tried to swallow water. Uh, anyway, it, it has games. It has some games. I'm not a gamer, so I don't really know much about how they run or anything like that. The only game I really play with any frequency is uh, Unreal Tournament um, 1999. Yes, I have been playing that game now for 22 years, and there are still servers out there on the Internet that serve it. But it's my favorite game. I've been running it forever. And it'll actually run under Win Linux pretty well, <laughs> uh, even though it's a, it's a Windows-based game. But there are Linux-based games. There is a great Office suite, um, LibreOffice, that is essentially a drop-in replacement, free. You don't have to pay dime one for it. It is free and open source. You can drop it in and use it in place of Microsoft Office. It is not 100% compatible. I have occasionally run across very, very complex spreadsheets that it doesn't like. But for the most part, if you're not doing weird, complex stuff, it is totally compatible. You, you, it looks like Office used to look before they got crazy with the, you know, the, the stupid bars and things like that. It looks like a normal program still. Um, you can import and export uh, Microsoft Office files, and I use it extensively. I use it very extensively, not for the Office programs particularly, but because of LibreOffice Draw. Everything you see in terms of my artwork goes into LibreOffice Draw. My lower thirds, my thumbnails, my chroma key images, all of that goes into LibreOffice Draw. And that's because LibreOffice Draw is what's called a vector-based drawing program. It's not like Microsoft Paint or some of those other programs where when you draw something, it's drawing little pixels. This is a vector program where if you draw a shape, it's describing how to draw that shape. 
And because I'm doing it in a vector way, when I export it out of LibreOffice Draw, it can be exported at any resolution without losing any detail. For example, <clears throat> you don't know it, but all of my artwork, God, all of my artwork is actually exported to 4K resolution. Uh, you see it as 1080p because it downscales when I'm putting it out to you, but all of this, the lower third, my, my chroma key image, everything is in 4K. Um, and you see no loss of definition. Everything that you see down here is not really text. It is text that has been turned into a vector type of drawing. I can export this to any size, large, small, doesn't matter, and you will never lose detail. It will always look good. That's what I use LibreOffice Draw for extensively. And I, I, my own operating system here that I run this with is Windows because it's a graphics laptop and it's kind of tied into the hardware in a way that I can't really run Linux. I'd like to, but I would suffer some performance problems if I did it. Um, but LibreOffice Draw is also LibreOffice is also available for other operating systems. It's available, I'm sure, for um, the uh, Mac. I'm sure it's available for. Uh, uh, I know it's available for uh, um, Windows because I use it. Again, drop-in replacement. You you really unless you're doing something very very weird, you won't notice the difference between using um, the LibreOffice suite versus Microsoft Office, and you won't pay any money for it. It's free, totally free. It's free and open source. People can look at the source code. It has been forked at least three times that I'm aware of. Uh, LibreOffice is currently one of the forks. OpenOffice is another fork. LibreOffice seems to be the most popular one, but it's the one I've been using since forever. It's ports of habit more than anything else. But it is a drop-in replacement. You can get programs that will, you know, play videos, play music. Um, there's a rhythm box, which is a program that you can use to organize all of your videos and all of your music. You can run things on it. I have a friend who takes one. He has a Raspberry Pi, which I'll talk about in a minute, and he's made it into an entertainment center. Basically, it plugs into his computer, his, uh, his big monitor, like a smart box, and he can watch anything that he wants to on it. It looks and acts like it's a television with a remote moat and all of that. It's very cool. Some stuff you could do with it. If you're a geek, my God, uh, boy, you can really, really get some interesting things done with it. It's very, very cool. Getting back to my uh, thing here. Uh, Open Office or LibreOffice? Libre is my choice. Uh, how are the Linux operating system graphics card drivers? Very good for the most part. Um, there are there are a few that you have to get that what are called proprietary drivers that are not open source. They're maintained by the company that makes the graphics cards. But all the really popular ones, you know, like NVIDIA, some of the AMDs, they're all there. You can get them. It's not a problem. Uh, it's amazing. Yes, Marshall says, getting amazingly easy to use, uh, to get exceptionally good GPU drivers. Used to be a major problem, but isn't anymore. Marshall's saying, you prefer the railgun on UT99. Well, I tell you in all honesty... I generally connect to a couple of different types of servers. Um, usually they're sniper servers. Servers that are dedicated to people who like to do sniping. And a lot of times they tend to be with maps where they've made um, giant maps. They've taken a room and scaled it up to be enormous. So you're moving on to chairs that are essentially 100 feet in the air, you know, things like that. I get a kick out of those kind of maps, but mostly I like sniping. Drop of Truth says, how is Linux uh, for antivirus tools? Asking because you do internet banking. Um, Linux is not even remotely susceptible to Windows viruses. It is really impossible. Um, the way Windows is layered out in terms of security makes it very difficult to get a virus in that even does things. But regardless, it still does have antivirus programs. I generally, when I was doing it, I don't know for sure what the landscape looks like right this moment, but I used to use Clam AV. Uh, as my antivirus programs. I ran it on anything just out of, you know, force of habit. There are firewalling programs that you can get that are essentially, you know, feature identical to the way that Windows Firewall works. Although the interface is a little different. And frankly, I find the interface easier on Linux. But then I've been using it for more than 20 years now. Um, yes, uh, you can also save with LibreOffice. You can also save uh, as Doc and DocX in their Word equivalents. Yes, you can import and export them. It's really great that way. Marshall says, antivirus tools with good selection, but the best security for Linux is that command above, apt to get update, apt to get upgrade. You can stay ahead of almost all the black hots. Yes, 
And again, that's something that we see mostly as systems administrators, but modern versions of the desktop operating system have something that's running in the background that will show you a notification, hey, there's upgrades for certain things. Do you want to upgrade them? And it'll just do what that app get and app up upgrade stuff is doing. Um, it'll do it in the background so that you don't have to worry about the command line side of it. It's what's going on under the hood. You just see a nice program that says, hey, here's some upgrades for you. Do you want to take them? The answer, by the way, is always yes. <laughs> always say yes to upgrades. Always, always, always. One of the biggest problems that it happens all the time when you're in a production environment is if you're not up on your upgrades. That is the worst thing that can happen. I have seen it a million times. You would be really surprised at some of the very sensitive stuff that you do on the Internet. They're running with servers that have not been updated for a long time. Always upgrade, especially with Linux. Um, SuperGroove 63 says, have to admit, I'm totally illiterate to all this tech talk, but trying to uh, listening, trying to understand. Feel free to ask me questions if you want to. Um, you know, when you get these distributions, usually they'll come. You know, you can put them, they'll come down as a file if you want to download them from like Linux Mint. And it'll have instructions about how to get them on a uh, flash drive. You just stick the flash drive in, boot from the flash drive rather than your hard drive which with more computers, Windows ones that use a certain type of UE, what's called UFI, that becomes a little more difficult. But there are instructions about how to do that. And on, usually on their website, there's lots of instructions. And you get it on a flash drive, stick it in, boot from the flash drive, let it run the install, boom, done. Now, you can run Windows alongside it. Um, if you, that's called a dual boot. It will give you the option when the computer starts up. Do you want to run Linux? Do you want to run Windows? You can have them run side by side. Not at the same time, but you can switch between them at boot. I don't generally do that. Um, my general feeling is, you know, I mean, if you want to do that, try out Linux. That's great. Generally speaking, I just install the whole thing under the Linux under the single computer and forget about it. Um, it depends what you're doing. Again, it, you don't want to use Linux uh, except under certain use case scenarios. You don't want to be a gamer using Linux. That, that would just be miserable. Drop2 says, I'm going to download this live stream reference purposes. Absolutely. Feel free. Feel free. Pull it down after the fact. I suggest using the 4K video downloader. You can find it. I've forgotten which website, but Google or DuckDuckGo.com. 4K video downloader. It will allow you to download the video in uh, 1080p and 60 frames per second, which when, which downloading it straight out of um, uh, out of the uh, my interface that I have for my videos will not do it. It'll only do 720p at 30 frames per second. Narsha says, the one big thing about Linux is that if you want the cutting edge of computing, that's where you'll find it. AI, computer vision, blockchain, which we'll be talking about with Marshall in a bit, voice command and control, it's all there now. Yes. The cutting edge stuff all happens on Linux. There's no question about it because that's where the geeks live. Very few of them you will find running anything other than some kind of Linux. The really high end geeks get just tweak the hell out of their machines, which is something else you can do if you want to. You can really, really, really tweak things to run incredibly fast, or you can tweak the hell out of it to do certain types of tasks, but it is very, very configurable and Generally, if you're a non-geek, the stuff that you're going to do on a daily basis, very, very easy to configure. Um, if And again, the upgrades are very, very simple. Marshall says Mac and Windows is typically five to ten years behind the state of the art, and that's absolutely correct. Bitcoin evaluation, too. Yes, we're going to talk about Bitcoin as well with Marshall as one of my special guests a bit later. Now, I am currently using, as I say, a Windows desktop because of the interface between Windows software and the specific hardware that I have and the specific use case that I have. It is a gaming laptop, but at the same time, it's so high-end graphics and intertwined with the operating system that allows me to do some things that would probably be I'd take a performance hit if I did it under Linux. I hate doing that. Um, I far prefer to be doing uh, uh, using Linux because it's more stable, because I don't have to worry about the damn thing wanting to, you know, just upgrade and not tell me about it. Um, I don't want to worry about having to make sure that all my programs are up to date because Linux will do that all for me. Um, but 
you can also do cutesy stuff if you want to get into uh, how to you know deal with the guts of things linux does offer a command line interface as a casual user like my mother you'll never know it's there <laughs> she never uses it this is what i have been using in my daily world uh, for since forever um you know it, it allows you to do simple things like if you want to get a oops sorry got the wrong fracking thing do, 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 do. where the hell is it i went to the wrong i was in the wrong window well, there's my command line sorry about that sorry about that chief let me get my uh, actual command line in focus oh let's get some penguins on it uh let's see marshall says all my high-end computing is on linux and trust me marshall's doing some extremely high-end stuff he does ai work and all kinds of other things uh the windows and mac cores aren't able to handle it in terms of algorithm intensity yes gtx 1070 is a space heater when i do advanced ai stuff on linux i'm sure it is What's my background today? Is it Norad or uh, Utah Server Farm? Uh, I have no idea. Um, what happens when I do for these? As I say, I run all my artwork through LibreOffice. And when I'm doing that, I always just look for something that looks like it might be apropos to my topic, but is a very high resolution, at least 4K if I can find it. And it has to be non-attributed and hopefully not copyrighted because I can get into trouble with that. So what you're seeing back here is some non-attributed high-resolution video of somebody's data center somewhere. I have no idea what it is. But as I say, you have a command line that you can get to if you want to. Don't know if you can see it very well because uh, the smallness of it, but you can do things like uh, get a directory listing of uh, all of the program of, of all the files in a particular. Uh, uh, you know, a, a, a particular uh, directory that you're in or folder that you're in. You can change folders. You can add and delete. You can, you know, copy, delete, remove files and all that stuff. And you can do a lot more complex things with it. When I was working in, in, in the industry, my general rule of thumb is if I have to do something more than once, automate it. And the command line allows you to do things like run things like shell scripts, which are kind of like programs. I had shell scripts at various places that I worked that were very, very complex. So suppose we had to roll out a new version of, the, uh, of a, a website that we were rolling out. And we're rolling it out to 300 different servers, right? Well, you don't want to have to go to every server and type the same thing in 300 times to get it to work. So we would automate that. We would write a shell script that knew which servers to go out to, what to do to them in order to upgrade this website, and hit the button and just sit there and wait for three minutes and it would be done it is very very useful when you want to do things like automating tasks that are repetitive very very useful the, the linux command line very very easy very very useful uh show us top well let me see if i've got top running on this it's taking its own sweet time let me um Uh, what's the machine? Um, I have another computer on my network that I'm going to get into here uh, that uh, will be a little bit more useful on this, and I'll talk about what this is in a second. Um, I'm going to run HTOP, actually. I prefer that program. HTOP is a program that will show you your CPU usage um, sort of real time. It'll show you all of the various things you can see here. These are various programs that are running on this computer uh, that I have that I'll talk about in a second, this specific computer. And then up here we have the memory usage and we have the CPU usage, which you'll notice on this particular server that I'm in is practically nothing. <laughs> and I'll explain why that is in a second. But this is showing from top to bottom, which is why it's called top or HTOP in what version I use. It's showing from top to bottom the ones that are eating up the most CPU time. That is, uh, the CPU is the part of the computer that basically is kind of its brain. And it's saying, okay, how much of the brain is being used? This computer is a four-core uh, computer. That means it basically has four CPUs. Uh, and you can see it's eating up almost none of it. It's doing almost nothing. Um, and 
uh, Marshall's going to be different when he has uh, his servers and stuff. They're going to be chugging along a lot faster than this. But I'll explain about what this computer is and what I'm using it for in a second. Um, let's see. Barter system still works. Going to talk about that. Yes, with Marshall. Uh, transmission, huh? Yes, I do. I, this, is, this server is doing a number of things. Let me explain that. Good time to get into it. Um, what I'm using, what you're seeing here with the statistics on this server, I am running a uh, Raspberry Pi 4. Um, uh, the uh, Let's see, I've forgotten which edition. Um, but uh, it's a Raspberry Pi 4. And this is a new kind of very fascinating type of computer. Not that new, but it is what's called a single board computer. It, everything on it is on a single circuit board. It has inputs and outputs like you'd expect. Um, and it's very, very small. Um, This is a Raspberry Pi, a uh, Raspberry Pi 4, uh, I forgot which edition, the latest one, that I'm not currently using right now. Um, I bought a kit for it. I have a link to it in my description box below. But I bought a kit for it. Um, you know, you can see it's got some of the standard interfaces, you know, network interface. It's also got Bluetooth. It's also got Wi-Fi. Um, it has outputs to go to my monitors. It has inputs for, uh, you know, um, USB 3 on it. Uh, all kinds of interesting stuff. <clears throat> but it's a single board computer, runs very fast. It can be in, uh, set up as a desktop. I've done it. Uh, but it's not what I use it for. Um, what I use it for is really simple stuff. Uh, I learned a long, long, long ago to never, ever trust files that you care about to your Windows computer. And never trust them. Uh, if you do, a crash and you'll lose everything that you care about. And I don't want to put stuff out on cloud services because A, they may cost money, and B, they may change, and C, they might just disappear if the company guns goes under. So I keep all of my very important, anything, really anything that I care about, all of the stuff for this uh, show, all of the uh, live streams that I download, anything that I create for it gets mirrored over to this server here, this one that I've got this HTOP running on. It mirrors it all over there to a pair of uh, 10 terabyte hard drives. Now, they basically act like one hard drive. One is mirroring the other, constantly mirroring the other. So if I lose the computer itself, I still have my two mirrored drives with everything I care about on it. If I lose uh, one of the drives, I still have everything that I care about on it. You would have to run into a really weird situation for me to actually use, lose my data. Um, you know, I, All I have is this with a pair of uh, USB 3.0, uh, high-speed, off-the-shelf, 10 terabyte hard drives plugged into it. That's really its main job. Marshall noticed that it's running transmission. I am running a BitTorrent server. Because I, I do what's called permaseeding. Um, if you uh, get into BitTorrent, when I'm permaseeding something, that means that I'm, I've got some BitTorrent that I think I want out there forever, either that I created or that is something that I want to make sure is out there forever. So I just let it run constantly. If I want to get new stuff, I uh, basically have a web interface on my regular computer that talks back to this server and I drop in anything that I might want to download to it. It talks back to this server and this server is doing all the hard heavy lifting. Not that it's doing much heavy lifting. You know, it's, it's barely ticking over for what I do. Uh, I know Marshall does a lot of stuff with Raspberry Pis that probably cause it to do a lot more. And Raspberry Pis are fascinating because you do all kinds of things with you that if you're on the geek side or the development side there are so many cool things that you can do with it um, that are just amazing these things are actually starting to take over data centers in some cases if you use amazon web services basically they've got whole server farms full of these um, much much smaller than your average x86 which is a traditional server much much smaller uh, very highly scalable very fascinating things you can do with them. As I say, I have a friend who uses one that is just his entertainment system. It, it's, that's all it is. He has it plugged into his big screen TV, and he runs his entertainment system on it. Me, I'm a geek, and I know how to find my entertainment without having to do that, but it's a great interface for him to do. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Drop two says we had the Let's Barter system late 1980s in southwestern Australia, Margaret River, for nearly a year until the government shut it down. No tax being paid, of course. Well, we'll talk about that too when we get to the crypto stuff in a bit. Got to look at my time here. So it's been almost an hour. That's good. Marshall says, lovely little machine to pie for. I love the uh, th all things Raspberry. Great for experimenting or spinning up utility servers. Also learning Linux. Yeah, absolutely. Number one at that. Dropper 2 says, so much to learn, so little time. Well, you know, the good thing about it is it's all out there. Everything that I'm talking about, you can find out about in excruciating detail. Um, as, you know, you can self-tutor as much as you want. There's so many different, because this is all open. There are so many different things that you can get into where you can start out as a complete neophyte and find out interesting things about it as a complete neophyte and move onwards and upwards as you go. Um, and as Marsh says, the Pi is a great uh, learning platform. It doesn't have to be a Pi, but they're really inexpensive. Um, the, the kit that I actually have linked to is about 100 bucks, but that's because it includes not only the single board computer. Yeah, I've got this one screwed in not only the single board computer because it's tiny there's this little tiny circuit board in here um, but also it's got this case for it and the case is a good thing it has uh, some cool cooling things going on with it that are a good thing when you're dealing with some of these higher end raspberry Pis. Uh, but it is a great little thing um, it can do a lot of stuff uh, the one that my friend has is a desktop computer for all intents and purposes for a while this was in fact my mother's desktop computer uh, and we changed it out for various reasons, but that's it was for a while and she had no idea. It looked exactly like Windows 95. That's how I tricked it out. Drop it to says, uh, how did I go with those bots? I was hassling. Oh, <laughs> uh, what happened was uh, there weren't really bots. Um, there were these two woke a-holes who decided to come in and throw you know, videos of like The Rock saying, uh, shut the hell up or something like that on a couple of my tweets for no reason that I could discover. So I started treating them as if they were bots. I said, okay, let's imagine these two idiots are bots. I'm going to start putting out keywords to see what they generate back. You know, so I started out with George Carlin's seven deadly words you can't say on television. I posted one to see what they would come back with. Then posted another one, see what they would come back with. Sometimes it would post the same word repeatedly to see if I got a different answer. This is how you would test to see how a bot is actually configured. You know, is it configured to spew out, you know, uh, answers based on keywords and stuff like that. So I was doing that over and over. They eventually got tired uh, because, hey, I have no, I can, I got patience, buddy. I got patience like a Jedi Knight. I can sit there and type words at you all you want. Uh, so I was just messing with them, and I was kind of inviting people to do the same if they wanted to go in and just throw a keyword in. Don't engage them at all. Just put a keyword in and piss them off. Make them frustrated because they're not go getting your goat. They're just being tested as if they were a bot. <laughs> um. Let's see, uh, permissating weird old movies. Not really. Um, let me get my interface up and I can tell you what I'm actually seeding right now. I am permissating all of the Star Trek Continues uh, Blu-ray discs. I want to do that. It's a, they, they distribute their Blu-rays via uh, BitTorrent. It's perfectly legal to seed them that way, so I seed them all that way. I am permaceding Superman The Final Cut, which is a, uh, a, 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 a fan edit of Superman from 1978. Uh, you know, basic thing you have to worry about there is my understanding anyway is if you want to watch that, you have to own a copy of the original. I have a few others uh, that are a little bit on the odd side. Um, just looking at the weirdest one I've got here. I have one that I created for myself called the Christchurch Shooting, and it's the full one because it has not, you remember this is the guy who went to a mosque or two of them uh, in New Zealand and shot up everybody. 
and he had a manifesto that he put out as one of the few times we can look at one of these guys and say wow this is the, this is what a crazy person looks like and it ha I have an archive of all the stuff that he had as well as an archive of like his uh, facebook page uh, his twitter account it's all there uh, i want that out there because permanently because i think you know it's like i said one of the few times you get a window into a real nut job you know what's going through his twisted brain um, it's really strange to have that happen, so I want that out there. So that's probably the oddest thing. Uh, Marshall Presnell thought a Raspberry Pi 4 is a lot more than 55 U.S. living in Australia. If you're just buying the circuit board itself, it's really cheap. Um, but if you're new to the things, I kind of suggest you buy maybe a kit that includes uh, the case like this uh, because it will help you out a lot when it comes to cooling. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 4s run kind of hot. And it's good to have the cooling features that are built into that case. Oh, um, my gosh. Boy. Let's see, Marshall says, one of the most amazing things about the Pi 4 8 gig model, which is uh, one of these things here, 75, is that you can re make a really full re uh, featured and highly capable uh, Kubernetes cluster uh, with seven or eight of them, a super cheap cluster for cheap. Uh, that gets into stuff that's more complicated than probably we need to do. But it is, when Marshall's talking about it, is indicative of just how uh, amazing some of this stuff on the Pi is. Uh, Marshall says, you're absolutely right. Sci-fi is now for all of us. It's that advanced now. Most of us don't realize it. Yes, I always say we live in a science fictional world. Everything that we look around and everything that I see right now did not exist, with very few exceptions, did not exist when I was born. And when I die, by then, everything else will have been completely replaced with something even more science fictional. Drop Drew says, I got bashed on Twitter for saying some of the scientific community act like religious zealots. Uh, when the basics, basis of physics and astrophysics is mere conjecture or mathematical theory only. Uh, yes, there's a whole long tweet thread. It's fascinating. It's been going on for coming up on what on a week. I've only been really monitoring it occasionally getting in. Uh, but it, it's been branching out into all kinds of other stuff. It's really fascinating. It's like the thread that never ends. It just goes on and on, my friend. It's just it's amazing. It keeps going on. But yeah, you've gotten some of that as well. Um, you know, there, there are some things that are, that are rather conjectural at this point that are very cool math, but it's unclear how much that math really relates to reality, and I agree with you on that. Uh, careful with the uh, New Zealand uh, CC stuff, Bill. You can only be in prison for, in New Zealand for 15 years just by possessing it. Well, I'm not in New Zealand nor subject to their laws, and people around the world should see the inner workings of a complete psychopath. It's very rare you see that. Now there are, as with everything uh, Linux related, there are different distributions for the Raspberry Pi. The one that most people use, the one I use, is called Raspbian. Link to that below as well. Uh, when you get a Raspberry Pi, it will not have the operating system already installed. But getting it installed is really easy. There's a lot of... <clears throat> Excuse me, there's a lot of different uh, um, uh, tutorials about it. Very, very simple to do. Uh, you know, if, you're, if you know how to put, here's the memory cards that they come with. Let's see if I can pull mine. I have a 512 uh, gigabyte, uh, what is it? It's so tiny. I'll, I'll put it up to the camera in a minute. Uh, well, it's one of these infinitesimally small ones. And it's green, so it's showing through. But absolutely tiny. Um, to get the operating system on it, you, you have to buy it, and most of them come with an adapter to go to, like, USB. But once you've got that, it's really, really, really easy to put the operating system on. And you just plug it in like I'm doing now. And once it's plugged in, you... Uh, you have a working computer, and Raspbian is the one that most people use. There are a couple of others, but it's the one that I use, and I, I think it suits most purposes fine. Um, let's see. Drop2 says, yeah, the, the, the lengthy thing that we've been involved in for a week or so now, it did start out uh, with something about new track, and it just went way off. SuperGuru63 says, I host some old DOS games that I really like. Is there a way to make them work? Yes, there is. There is. There is a great uh, program that runs under Linux called DOSBox. 
and it will run your DOS programs slicker than you'd imagine. Um, really, really fast. Uh, I, I actually have, <laughs> I have one that runs Windows 3.1 in a window on my computer. It's faster than any native computer I ever ran Windows 3.1 on. <laughs> it's amazing. You can run all kinds of stuff. Yeah, DOS games are no problem. I have two or three of my own that I have like that. Yes. Um, VTREK. V-T-R-E-K. And it only ever shows up if you like do a search for VTREK.exe. But it is a port over of the very, very early original uh, Trek program that you found in uh, text-based uh, computing way back when. And by the way, there is a program that you can get for Linux, the original text-based Trek. Um, but this is a nicer one with a little gooey. It's probably the best one, frankly, that I think has ever been made, including the Windows ones that tried to do the same thing. So DOS program, one's fine on DOSBox. Not a problem with it. Yes, I'm sorry. You're right, uh, Marshall. The storage a storage card that I've got is the 128 uh, gig one. Um, that's what I was showing was the storage box. The RAM itself is hardwired. You cannot upgrade RAM on these. Um, try to, if you're buying them, try to buy the ones uh, that have the most RAM. You, you'll be, you know, giving yourself some leeway, basically, technically. But like I say, look at mine, man. Barely ticking over for what I do with it. Yes, it is a micro uh, SDHC card, and they're cheap as chips. They're pretty much cheap everywhere. They're really very inexpensive. Um, but, yeah, you get one of those and a USB adapter for it, which they almost always sell with them because they know you're going to be plugging it in at some point to a computer. Um, once you got that, putting Raspbian on them is really simple. Plug it back in, stick a monitor on it. Uh, keyboard or mouse, or you you know use use uh, the Bluetooth. It's got Bluetooth. Um, you're done. You're there. You have a computer. It, out of the box, it's going to look just like a desktop computer. Used to work, Marshall says, but the author of Windtrek, Joe Jaworski. Okay, talking about all the Trek stuff reminded me of him. I need to go find him. It's been years. I didn't. Yeah, Windtrek was another good port. I still like VTrek, the old DOS game. I really do. That is, in a nutshell, uh, what Linux is about. It is an operating system that runs better than Windows, will work better than Windows on older computers, is completely taken over the backend server of everything that you do on the Internet and stands a chance of Microsoft going to it as the basis for the Windows operating system. It, it's a good idea. Boy, would their upgrade processes get a lot more and become a more stable platform. It would be a lot more useful for upgrading. I hope they, I keep waiting. We keep waiting. All of us have been using this for years, just waiting for that box that says Microsoft Linux on it. <laughs> Drama True says uh, to Oliver Frank 10, he called me a Neanderthal because I didn't use calculus or statistical derivatives even when working uh, as a consultant engineer for construction purposes. I don't know anything about that side of it. I haven't been paying a whole hell of a lot of attention to that. Uh, the last couple of days when I've been on Twitter, and I, I frankly try not to as much as I can, to be honest. When I've been on Twitter, I have been noticing a bunch of bullies. I wouldn't call them bullies. I can't call anything online really bullying. But a bunch of guys who will get on here. They're sub to Kevin Sorbo. I, I, I follow Kevin Sorbo. He tends to, you know, post stuff that's religious. He's a devout Christian. And he'll post things that are religious. And there are people who are following him just to be complete a-holes to him. And, and occasionally I'll respond to them that, no, you're just wrong about this. You know, you're just wrong. You're just being an a-hole. You know, you, why are you doing this? You know, why are you bothering with this? Do you have nothing better to do in your day than sit around and talk to, uh, you know, and try to, uh, you know, badmouth a guy who's just giving out what his beliefs are? You know, why are you ragging on the Christian? Why? You know, here's a guy, who, Kevin Sorbo, who has essentially been blacklisted because he's a conservative, because he is a Christian. And I get on those with, and I just, why are you doing this? What business is it of yours of his, what his, you know, his religious beliefs are? I'm an atheist, right? Like, what business is it of yours? Why are you coming down on this guy? What's the point? You know, that's mostly what I've been doing. Fruitlessly, I may add. Um, but, uh, you know, it bugs me, so I do that. So, that is pretty much what I have to say about Linux. One other thing that I have to mention. You'll notice down here that it's saying new Linux. That GNU is pronounced new. 
that is a recursive, um, a three-letter acronym, stands for new is not Unix. Here's the deal. A lot of the very core programs that are used uh, for day-to-day -day tasks and some that are more complex are uh, maintained by a, uh, an outfit called the, uh, uh, the New Foundation, GNU Foundation. This is run by a guy named Richard M. Stallman, or RMS, as he's known in the geek world. RMS likes to have Linux told, uh, mentioned as new Linux, GNU slash Linux. Uh, and this is because he thinks that not having that in there is minimizing the amount of effort that has gone into making all of these tools that work under Linux for so long. He's kind of right about that. i got to give him credit. He's kind of right. But for the most part, people don't call it new Linux because it's more complicated to explain what the hell that means. And I had a brush with RMS years ago. I was writing an article that was aimed at complete neophytes about Linux. And uh, I, I emailed him to ask him a couple of questions. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I mentioned what I was doing. And he was like, well, make sure you, you, you know, call it new Linux. And I'm like, well... And sent back, I don't know that I could do that. It's complicated. It just makes things more difficult. I'll probably just call it Linux. And he got into a giant huff. We went back and forth about two emails before he finally sent me something back that said, all of your emails from now on are going to dev null. Well, if you're a geek, slash dev slash null, which we call dev null, is where you send something if you just want it to disappear. It's like sending it nowhere. So all of my emails to RMS, one of the most famous guys in computing ever, are now going straight to nowhere. He gets no emails from me at all and hasn't for over 10 years. He is really big on calling it new Linux, but nobody does really. Only he and some of the people he's associated with. But you have to give him credit. A lot of these programs, some of the stuff that I'm running up here, uh, originate with his foundation. And it's all free. It's open source. And, uh, you know, there's a case to be made for calling it new Linux, but nobody ever does. There's very few distributions and stuff to do. So let me drop out of my command line here. Drop out of uh, where I'm got for that. Uh, <laughs> Marshall says, all of my emails come from DevNull. Uh, tends to solve any problems. Yes. <laughs> So that's Linux. Feel free to ask me any other questions that you may want to ask me about that. I am happy to answer all of them. Um, and if you have any questions, you know, that I'm not covering here, feel free to put them into uh, my, uh, 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 my comments. God knows I could use comments. You can you know, catch me up on social media. Uh, most of the ones that I use regularly are listed in my description box. But certainly feel free to put comments down and I will respond to them if I humanly can. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.